Jim Keyes, welcome to Listening with Leaders. I am, as I said before we started recording, my jaw dropped when I looked at your background. You have been the CEO of 7-Eleven Blockbuster, I presume, before before it went under. There's a story there, I'm sure. Wild Oats Marketplace, a great shopping grocery store, and also fresh and easy. So you went from convenience store to videos, back to marketing, to market grocery marketing and groceries and marketing. So it sounds like you've been all over the place. Welcome to the show. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your background? It's not often I get people who have been serial CEOs with some big name, well-known companies. Yeah, I don't think of myself as a serial CEO. I spent 21 years at 7-Eleven, so I was there quite a while. Oh, a long time. Yeah. Blockbuster, five or six years. Uh, my timing could have been better with Blockbuster. I jumped in and 07, just as the financial markets were about to implode. Ooh. Yeah, exactly. But we saw it through. And so, yeah, tell me about, tell you about me. I am an unlikely Fortune 500 CEO. I uh, grew up small town, Massachusetts, public school kid, house, no running water and all kinds of chaos surrounding my life as a kid and uh, found the path to corporate America via education, candidly. I had no idea what business was. It mm. was the factory my dad worked at, which I wanted no part of. That was my only frame of reference for business. And so somehow, some way, the path through education led me to the corporate world. And I found that by continuing to learn, I could do anything I wanted to do in just about any company. Did you get it? Did you have formal education? I did. I was fortunate enough in high school to do well. And teachers are huge. I cannot say enough about teachers. I agree. They, with all of the grief that our school system is getting and people throwing rotten apples at them. Don't get me, don't get me started. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Because, because they, are, they are the only line of defense that we have for the next generation. And they can change lives. And they do change lives every single day. So for all the negatives that are out there, there's a hundred positives that teachers have and do. And they did it to me. They inspired me. They coached me. They encouraged me to continue to learn and demonstrated to me that the, that the more effort you put in, the more you're going to get out of it. And it was so true. Uh, yeah, blew through high school, ended up with a, an opportunity to go to a four-year school not far from where I grew up, a place called Holy Cross. And uh, in Boston, and, yeah, outside of Boston and of Worcester, Mass. And then I was again, I was one of these kids that had no frame of reference. So, doctor or lawyer was like the pinnacle of what I could be. I was too squirmish to be a lawyer because I didn't think the opera room, operating room was for me. And I was going to be a lawyer, but intercepted by a professor who said, You make a terrible lawyer, please get an MBA at least, the JD MBA at least. And the only school that offered that at the time was Columbia. They had just introduced oh, okay. this new joint degree program. So I applied to Columbia and by some miracle, this kid that showed up from his interview in a powder blue suit with bell bottoms, literally, <laughs> now why? <I> <laughs> Hell's out to here. I think they thought, this guy's a clown. We got to let him in. He's... <laughs> so you got into the JD MBA program. Yeah, and actually the business, the law school, put me off for a year and the business school let me in. So I did it in reverse. I started at the B school and ended up with an internship in the summer with Gulf Oil, sent me to Texas, fell in love with Texas. And Gulf asked me to go back to school, finish the MBA and offered me a full-time job working for the CFO uh, at the time. So I was starving to death at that point after college loans and grad school loans. So I said, sure, and put off the uh, JD piece of it. Never ended up looking back. Probably good. As, as a JDMA, you didn't miss anything. Okay. That's, not, that's really not true. But I tell young kids today, yeah, get a law degree, but don't become a lawyer. Yeah, I, I think it's good. It's, it's really good discipline and good education. Right. Uh, but yeah, I would have made a terrible practicing lawyer. Yeah, no, I was a civil trial lawyer for 22 years. Tried big cases here in California and all over the U.S. So I wouldn't recommend it as a career choice. In fact, I left in 2000 to become a peacemaker. But that's another story. So you finish your MBA, you're working for golf, working for the CFO. Yeah, and timing's everything. I had, my timing was just as PCs were entering the market. So here I am. 1980s. Um, yeah, they had not, they had not hired MBAs. It was, the oil companies were classic chemical engineers, mechanical engineers, 
that that's it. And I was poly sci in Nebraska. So <laughs> I was total fish out of water. But I had discovered the power of a personal computer and brought it to work. And it was amazing. I was cranking out reports for the CFO on M&A activity. We were running uh, crude oil against reserves, crude oil reserves against uh, equity value to see what it would take to acquire Texaco or city service or whatever. And uh, city service was at the top of my list every week. We ended up, we made a run on city service, street hated it. They crushed the stock. Boone Pickens then made a run on, on golf. And I was there at the shareholder meeting when he gave his read his good speech, his Gordon Gecko. Right. <laughs> <company>. <laughs> right. <laughs> oh yeah. I swear. It was funny. Really a learning experience. And anyway, they ended up merging with Chevron and I joined Chevron for a little while. I was part of the merger team, but a gentleman that I'd working, been working with at Gulf went to the Southland Corporation. They had bought the downstream of, of city service, which was Citco Petroleum. Oh, okay. For supply of gasoline to 7-Eleven stores. So that's how I got to 7-Eleven via wow. the oil business, ironically. Oil business to Southland, hmm. working on get, getting the gasoline supplier to all the 7-Eleven stores all over the United States. Yeah, exactly. And, and it was a heck of an opportunity because I was really young, but they didn't know anything about the oil business. So they bought an oil company and I was from an oil company. So even in spite of my age, I literally had a little stropey mustache. <laughs> I, I had to... I think I, I grew saw, it. I think I saw pictures of you on your website. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I had to grow it to make myself look older because I oh, was like three cool. years old or something and running a two billion dollar retail gasoline business for seven. Were you running? Were you, did you end up running the gasoline business? Yeah. What happened is I, I came in as the head of strategic planning for Citgo because they needed to. They bought this downstream refineries marketing operation. But they had never really run, this is 7-Eleven, they were retail companies. And the guys at Citgo were always part of an integrated oil company. So all they knew is run the refinery at full capacity. We monetize crew. We don't care if we make any money at retail because we're going to make it all upstream. So now they had to make money out of this business. It was a pretty easy turnaround that we accomplished, made a boatload of money on that refining and marketing business. And 7-Eleven decided to sell it and keep a supply agreement. So they sold Citgo to Pedevesa, which gave me an opportunity. They then invited me to stay with 7-Eleven and let me run the retail gasoline business, which was that 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 was a pretty wow. big career opportunity for that's a, kid. a big that was a big deal. That had to be what hundreds of millions of dollars in those days, maybe billions, billions, yeah. 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 And it was Thankfully, it was one of those really unique opportunities because at the time they saw gasoline as a traffic builder. That's it. Mm -hmm. Way to get people on the lot into the store. Right. I looked at it and the oil companies were using it as a way to monetize crude oil. So no one was really making money at gasoline. And I started using data again, access to a PC, looking at it going, guys, we're, let's face it, 7-Eleven inside wasn't a very good value. And we're driving people onto the lot, losing sometimes 10 cents a gallon to get people to, to be the lowest price in town and get people on the lot. And then they wouldn't go in the store. So when I took over the retail gasoline business, we were literally losing money at 20% of the locations. Wow. Yeah. And with no clear, I ran a simple regression against the traffic going inside and whether or not increase or decrease gasoline traffic would affect the inside of the store. Zero correlation um, between the gasoline sales and the inside sales, which I attributed to the price difference. Inside was thought to be expensive, outside was cheap. Mm -hmm. Uh, So we just changed our strategy. We started using data to price gasoline for uh, optimal margin. In other words, we're gonna make money on this instead of just managing it to drive traffic. And, And that, that, literally produced about an incremental 50, 60 million bucks a year in, in incremental EBITDA for the wow. summer. Yeah. Yeah. So they like that. The, the, the senior guys above you like that, didn't they? Yeah, they did. And, 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 and right about that time, the company did an LBO. They took on $4 billion of debt at 17%. Oof. The Southland Corporation. Yeah. And uh, so this company. had to be in the late eighties when LBOs yeah. were rage. Mm-hmm. 87. Yeah, exactly. Our inflation rates were 22% or something like that. Something. Ridiculous. Oh yeah. It was, it was insane. And, and it's like buying a company on your credit card. Exactly. And it was, so it was just a matter of time before 
that debt load crushed the company and we had to do a restructuring. So here I'm sitting on the mm -hmm. one business that blew away all of its LBO estimates. So we were making money. The rest of the store was losing money. And it turned out that that crisis, the restructuring, LBO and then restructuring, ended up being a, an opportunity for me and for the company because I came out with a promotion, led strategic planning for the whole company following that re restructuring. And the company had to reinvent itself. We, we, wouldn't, have, we wouldn't have remade 7-Eleven but for that crisis. Hmm. So I coined an expression as a result of that and a whole bunch of other issues that I've ended up facing, Blockbuster, et cetera. And the expression is that CEO, we all think of as chief executive officer. I think of it as change equals opportunity. There you go. Yeah, it, it, it is. It's the role of the CEO. It's the role of all of us in business to embrace change and recognize that all commerce begins and ends with change. Right, because nothing's constant. No, something changes and someone responds to it and they're compensated for it. Right. And yet the irony, the giant irony is when change happens as individuals and as corporations, we're like, no, I don't want to, I don't want to change. Look what's going on now in the tech world. AI is coming on strong. Google is deeply threatened by it. Microsoft's trying to embrace it, but they can't do anything right. And Facebook is a complete disaster, <laughs> but it's all because it's changing so fast. Nobody knows what to do. It is exactly. And, and, and I think that the, what, I, what I've discovered is the bigger the company, the harder it is to change. Of course. It, it, there's an inertia that sets in, unfortunately. And it's it comes down to people because companies are organic beings, right? They're made up of people. Right. And people don't like change. We say we do, but even no, me, I'm not there preaching change. Right, exactly. Change something in my life and I'm going to be like, whoa, wait. <laughs> so you became the CEO of Southland for a while. Yeah. And then how do you how wow. do you end up at Blockbuster before <laughs> the, the Blockbuster debacle? debacle? For a while, that was twenty one years of Seven Eleven. That that's a long, long, long time. It's a long run, yeah, yeah. I got the good fortune coming out of bankruptcy. I was uh, head of planning, and then CFO, and then chief operating officer, and then CEO. I had a good run, and we drove the equity value from under four bucks to to just about forty dollars a share wow. during my term as CEO. So we had a really good run, and. And I attributed it virtually all to the power of technology and being able to better manage the business, whether it was gasoline pricing or uh, product assortment and using data to make better ordering decisions, et cetera. So when we sold 7-Eleven in 05 to our largest licensee, 7-Eleven Japan, I wanted to do it again. I was still pretty young. So I said, that was fun. <laughs> <laughs> Let's find another horribly broken, clueless company that that is is that needs transformation. And I looked around the landscape. I had two. Ironically, Radio Shack, which you think, oh, yeah. why would anyone want Radio Shack? That was for a long time. It was a real driver. It was the thing, yeah. The Shack at the time even was the largest retailer of phones in the country. Yeah. And yet, ironically, they weren't even selling the Apple phone. Because their perception was the Apple phone had too sm a margin that was too small. <laughs> they wanted a bigger and margin. They want, and they didn't want to get into, P into PCs either, computers. Yeah, they were reluctant to get into PCs. So uh, anyway, I just I saw it as a convenient access to electronic devices. Uh, so it was a convenient store for electronics, mm -hmm. I saw. So I was intrigued by it. I was on the roadshow with a deck in my bag. I also had a second deck, and that was for Blockbuster. Mm. Because, the, and I know this sounds crazy, but in the back of my head, the Apple store had just emerged. And Apple cracked a code, entirely new approach to retail. Not a lot of inventory. They sold hardware, software, and solutions. Right? Right. And experiences. Yeah. That so, was the uh, thing. Hardware was the phones, the blah, 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 the devices. The software was the operating system, iOS operating system, and the cloud. And they weren't to the cloud yet, but directionally. And then the support was the genius bar, every store. Right. We were carrying Blackberries, Dell computers, Sony TVs. <laughs> Why couldn't we make those work together just like Apple had? We could. And that was the idea. Blockbuster sold content, which was software, 
In other words, mm -hmm. rent DVDs. Radio Shack sold hardware, phones, computers that could have sold other things. Why not bang those two together and have a, a technology agnostic Apple store, if you will? That was the uh, the grand vision. And I was out, like I said, on the roadshow trying to get PE support for one or both of these acquisitions and possibly bang them together. And PE was actually quite receptive. I was in an investor's office pitching Radio Shack and he said, gee, it's too bad you don't have something like this for Blockbuster. So I reached in my bag. I pulled out a second deck. <laughs> <laughs> I said, here. And he got on the phone five minutes later, called Carl Icahn and said, Carl, you got to talk to this guy. He's got a he's got an idea for Blockbuster. And sure enough, 20 minutes later, I'm in Carl's office. And um, here was my fatal mistake. Carl said, I was trying to take a private. Carl was like, ah, keys. You're, a re you're the operator. I'm the financial guy. Public, private, you know how to run public companies. No big deal. I'm like, Carl, we have a billion dollars of debt. We've already violated bank covenants. Mm. It would be a lot easier just to restructure this thing, just to, just to refinance the debt now. Let's take it private. I can do this transformation to digital outside of the glare of public yeah. scrutiny. It'd be so much easier. Ah, don't worry about it. Okay. He didn't know, and I didn't know. A year later, Lehman would melt down, and yeah. that, that would be impossible to get financed. So hindsight- the technology changed, right? Yeah, the technology was no problem at all. Yeah, that's the misconception on the street. Oh, okay. So oh, yeah. Buster didn't die because of technology. It died- No. We, the first thing we did when I got there was in 2007, we acquired a company called Movie Link. Movie Link- was created by the studios to avoid the situation we have now, which is this massive fragmentation of digital. Right. So they put together 3,000 titles, mostly new releases of the best movies out there. And they were all working together, but they didn't get along quite so well because they're arch enemies, right? The right. Sony versus Paramount. Which, right. So they decided they were going to sell that business to Blockbuster, which they did. And so we owned a far superior digital streaming platform. Nobody remembers this. No. Because nobody was streaming. The only people streaming were kids on their Xbox. Right. So they weren't even doing that yet when we bought Movie Link. So we bought this company that positioned us extremely well versus Netflix. A very different model. We had the opportunity when we made that acquisition to acquire exclusively a about 60% of the long tail content. Had we done that exclusive deal, Netflix would still be doing DVDs by mail. Wow. But again, it was 2007. We still had aggressive buffering in Wi-Fi. Most households didn't have very robust Wi-Fi. Right. Apple had just launched the iPhone. Apps were something brand new. TVs were dumb. There was really not an easy way to get your content into someone's TV. You remember Roku came out with a little separate device, mm -hmm. right? It, it was uncertain how long that process. Now, the certainty was, yes, we're going to go to digital. No doubt. Blockbuster knew that. Mm -hmm. Everybody knew that. The uncertainty was, how long will it take to be profitable selling digital content? So what caused the shutdown of all the retail stores? We... Because of our debt and our inability to refinance it, we had no choice but to restructure the company. In the restructuring, we found strategic partners, had a really close to a deal with Google that didn't come down because rumor leaked that we were going to file and Google said, we don't have the stomach for it, we'll come back later. Instead, we found another strategic partner, Dish Networks. Hmm. Dish helped us in the restructuring took the company through uh, chapter 11 with Dish there on the other side. They bought the company wow. out of seven, out of uh, chapter. Um, they then, their strategy was at the time to not mess around with the internet. What they really wanted to do was to go straight to mobility. So, so sat direct TV, satellite distribution. Direct TV, satellite distribution, but also with mobility because they had bought a bunch of spectrum um, out there. So their play was for bandwidth to improve dramatically over what it was at the time via mobility, 
And that would be a better platform for streaming than the traditional internet as we knew it. Now, the only problem with that strategy is they also had plans at the time that were looking at buying T-Mobile, Sprint, maybe bang it all together, use the Blockbuster stores to sell this killer service. With every cell service you order, you'd get free Blockbuster movies and then movies on demand. It was, it was a beautiful strategy, but they were probably 10 years ahead of their time in terms of, look, look where we are now, we're barely to 5G today. Right. right. So the best laid plans, sometimes you're ahead of your headlights and that's where Dish was. So they ended up, they chose to then close down the stores, put the Blockbuster brand on the shelf. They put movie, movie link or Blockbuster on demand on the shelf. And here we are. And now you're out of the job again. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I advised that I helped them as an advisor for a couple of years and I wasn't worried about the job. I just wanted the success of the company. So what are you doing today? I do a whole host of things. I, I I dabble in a lot of different companies. I sit on a couple of boards. I sat on a board with uh, a SPAC with the Andretti family. We had a successful acquisition via the SPAC mm -hmm. of a data company, an AI company. I sit on a couple of other boards and I do a lot of work, mostly with startups. I, I really enjoy the startup space and especially interested in aerospace as you That's piloted. Cool. So uh, I've partnered with a group of guys, former SpaceX guys, developing the next heavy rocket to be able to have uh, more efficient delivery of satellites and right. people. Wow. But yeah. fun. And I know fun that fun. you've got a real passion for education too. I do. I just finally launched a book. I've been involved in education initiatives really my whole life as a way to give back since I was fortunate. And I want to share the belief that education is the key to unlocking opportunity for anyone. And so I've written a book called Education is Freedom. Now, see that, that back there on your desk. Good for yeah. you. <laughs> sure, let's pitch it. Here we go. Education Tell us a little bit. I don't, I, don't, I don't normally pitch books on this show, but go ahead. Tell us, <laughs> tell us what the book's about. It, it is originally intended for young people. It's a roadmap for success. Okay. I've got this thing called the C-suite of learnings, and it's what to learn how to learn, and why to learn. Now, I intended it for young people. What I didn't realize until launching the book is that my biggest demand, biggest audience for this, the demographic is probably 25 to 40, and it's entrepreneurs. Wow. Because they use a lot of business stories from 7-Eleven and Blockbuster. Sure. And I honestly believe that if you had the chance to go back to yourself and 20 years old, what would you say? Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's what's in that book, yeah, right? Well, there you go. Cool. All of those learnings that I wish someone had told me. It's all, it, the, the better way to describe it is it's all of those soft skills that ended up helping me learn to learn because I still learn every day. As a pilot, you can relate to this. Absolutely. It's about constant learning and being successful in a company, whether it's an entrepreneur or a multi-billion dollar company requires constant learning and learning to learn is one of the biggest challenges people how have. to learn and what to how learn, to learn. Yes. what's important what not to waste your time on yeah you want me to give you an example sure okay so three things I, I i characterize as the what to learn so before you even get past go if you can't do these three things you're done right change confidence Clarity. Now think change, about that. Confidence, clarity. Three yeah. words, triple C. If you can't embrace change and see the positive in any changes, bone crushing, soul crushing as that change may be, and it happens to all of us. Mm -hmm. If you can't look at that change and say, I don't know where it is, but there's a silver lining in this, and darn it, I will find it. And I'm going to keep my head up and I'm going to work harder, not slower. I'm going to work harder to find that opportunity in this change because that is, as I said, it's the root of all commerce. And so why let it get you down? Right. It's not the change. The change is irrelevant. It's our response to change. Internal so, fear. That's the second one. Thank you. <laughs> so let's say you can embrace change. Okay, I got this. I deal with change. Now, do you have the confidence to do anything about it? Or are you frozen in fear? Oh my gosh, I can't make a decision. A little person on your shoulder telling you you're not good enough, you're not smart enough. We are all, I'm guilty of that. It happens. I was at Blockbuster and I'm thinking, oh, 
woe is me, I start blaming other people and like, it's not my fault. Get over it. And you must be able to suppress that fear. Right. It, it fear is a very cloud. I'd say walking through the wall of fire. Just have the courage to walk through the wall of fire. Exactly. You know what I use? I, I have one here. It's a great prop. And you'll really appreciate this. As an aviator, I call it the difference between the caveman brain and the aviator brain. The caveman brain is that amygdala, that portion of our brain that fight or flight. And that saved us from being eaten by a predator. Right. We don't have predators. And yet in the boardroom, out comes that caveman fear, right? We're fighting rah, over my dead body, blah, blah, blah. Or withdrawn, right? Out of fear. We don't like the change. Something's going to happen here. It's going to threaten my job. Now, what would happen to a pilot if we let that portion of our brain? Yeah. You're done. Fight. We're going to over control the airplane. We're going to bend away. Oh, you're going to. Yeah. Nothing but bad things. And that's Light. why the training, the training is so intense. That's why the training is so intense. What do they train us? I sit in a simulator once a year for three days, flight safety. The only way I get to fly the citation, they make me go through this drill. And they, and they make try to just throw every error at you they possibly can, every catastrophic Everything. possible. Oh, yeah. Wind shear, engine fires, dual engine flame out over and over. Now, think about what we do. I can't fight it. Or I'm going to bend the airplane crash. I can't withdraw out of fear. I immediately turn to my emergency checklist. There you go. Pull out the emergency checklist. Dual engine flame out. Step one. Step two. Get to 28,000 feet. Get my airspeed to a certain level. Restart the engine. Can't restart the engine? Look for a field. <laughs> yeah. But there's a series. So in other words, I am overcoming fear with knowledge. But, but knowledge, but also intense practice. Oh, intense practice. Preparation. 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 I Prepare mean, to win. Uh, we've Are all we been in those experiences. I'll never forget, stupidly, launching out of Santa Barbara to try to be the front, climbing up over the, get out of the mountains. At least I got the altitude, but on my, I lost everything. Squawk well, 7,600, 7,700, then 7,600. Couldn't talk to anybody. I could hear, but it couldn't talk. They were all panicking. I just stayed on my course. And finally, I broke out. I got ahead of the front. <laughs> Things dried out, and I could. But how do you solid eye up? What do you do? Yeah. Go back to your training and say, "All right, fly the airplane. I'm high enough up. I'm not going to hit anything. I'm heading exactly. to the valley. I'm going to be good." Exactly. <laughs> you know? Har Harvey McKay. I'm blessed to be a friend with a few lawyers and uh, a few lawyers. <laughs> oh gosh, no, a few authors. <laughs> Harvey McKay, John Maxwell, guys like that. And Harvey gave me some advice for the book. I was asking him about. How do I teach people confidence? And he gave me those three words. He said, prepare to win. That's right. Preparation is everything. And that's why you train. And then when that's why Tom Brady is, is confident when he walks on the field. He's and that's why you that's why you learn. You learn part of the learning process is the preparation. Yeah. For everything yeah. that's gonna happen to you. Exactly. When I, was, when I was a trial lawyer, I'd prepare for trial. And the question I always asked my team was, okay, what do we do if Something completely unexpected that we haven't seen happens. What's our response to the unknown? Exactly. I use the example of when you're a kid and you're scared and you turn the light on at night, you realize there's no monster under the bed. That's right. And, and that's what knowledge is. Knowledge is the light. Cool. So, yeah, this is a rocket science. It's pretty easy. Dealing with change, having the confidence to do something about it, which comes from preparation and knowledge. And then the third is maybe the hardest it's simplification it's that clarification so okay. clarity of inbound communications listening which we are all guilty right how often are we i i teach people how to do this in listening we never learn how to listen as children we're ordered to listen as students right. we're ordered to listen as employees we're ordered to listen but we're yes. never taught how to listen exactly I, i'm aiming to change that mentality because i have a way of teaching people how to listen so I need to put that in my next book because it's, <laughs> it's so critically important because we are responding often before we're even hearing another point of view. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, my, so, book, my fourth book's called De-Escalate. Oh, I'm yeah. an angry person in 90 seconds or less. You can get it off Amazon. I love it, I love uh, it. You're right, so the three C's. So you've got yeah. change, build confidence. your confidence, 
and clarity. And to get clarity, simplify. Yes. Einstein said the, the, that if you can't explain something, uh, if you can't explain it to a six-year-old, you don't understand it well enough. Exactly right. I totally, as a teacher and educator, I totally endorse that. Take complex subjects and make it easy for people to understand. Yeah. Well, cool. Neil deGrasse Tyson's got a great analogy I put in the book. He, he talks about algebra. And most, most kids don't understand why you had to learn algebra. Mm -hmm. He said, I'm an astrophysicist. I don't use algebra. <laughs> but he said, I learned in algebra that you start with the parentheses and you solve for that. And then you go to another parentheses and you solve for that. And then you do the multiplication and the division. And you break this thing into pieces and pretty soon you get down to the bottom. That's easy. I can solve that. Right. And it's the answer. And he said, basically, that's the same approach we take to, to complex problems in life. Break it down into simple component pieces and then work the problem until you get a solution and keep working through it. I call it the algebra of thought. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. It's all doable. But those three things. Truly, if I was to, I, I call that what to learn, because it's fundamental to being able to go forward. If you can't deal with change and don't have confidence to do anything about it and can't clarify, you'll never learn. You'll never learn going forward. And then the how is, it's very simple. It's critical thinking, which is, right. we all learned the Socratic method. And, right. There's all kinds of reasoning in, in, encompasses a number of different skill sets that we all yeah. we learn starting at a very young age. But I, I, so here's what's really interesting. Uh, I know we're getting on a little longer than I planned, but this is so fascinating. <laughs> so when we're dealing with problems, we're going we're gonna to use your formula, the three C's, plus we're going to include critical thinking and that sort of stuff. Yeah. Good. But I teach something different. I say in relationship. Yeah. In human relationship, abandon reason. Abandon reason. Abandon reason. There is okay. no place for rationality in relationships. Because relationships are based on emotion and you need emotional tools to deal with relationship, not cognitive tools. Yeah. And that's the yeah. big mistake that everybody makes. And this is why there's so much conflict. Yeah. And so what I teach is a set of emotional tools that how do you deal with people who are really angry or upset? How do you build instant loyalty trust with a team? How do you become the leader everybody wants to follow? And you do it by listening other people into existence, listening to yeah. their emotions, not their words. Yeah. I love that. I think it is woven into my how and what to learn. There you go. I'll be curious after you read the book to see if you agree, but yeah. because I talk about in the, actually in the why to learn, talk about this and that collaboration is ultimately why we have to learn. That collaboration is the key to I mean, everything. We yeah, can't, everything. We right. can't do it by ourselves. And then, and I use cultural literacy as a way to say, I got more to learn from other people and the right. more different they are, the more I can learn from them. Exactly. And, and character is that piece, I think that you're talking about that integrity, humility, gratitude, compassion. Right. Yep. Those All are the things are critical pieces. Yep. I call that our, the brand. And when I'm talking to kids, especially as you like Coke or Pepsi, <laughs> what's your brand when right. people look at you? Exactly. Fun stuff. Yeah. yeah. I got one more question for you, and then I'll let you go, because I know you're a busy guy. What's one thing about yourself that we wouldn't know about unless you revealed it to us? Oh, I got a talker to stop talking. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. <laughs> I think there's so much out there about me now on the internet, it'd be hard to... <laughs> It'd be hard to find well, it. The, 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 I'll, I'll give you an example for me. You wouldn't know it, but I'm a jazz violinist. Oh, wow. That's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. That's very cool. I do an awful lot of things. And most people wouldn't know it. I think I, I'll tell you what people wouldn't know about me, that I am a, a person of pretty, pretty strong faith. Huh? And I, and I, I but I, even in the book, I don't talk, I, I, I don't talk about, Catholicism or Protestantism or Buddhism or Islam, I talk about Paulo Coelho in saying the universe, if you want something bad enough, the universe will conspire to make it happen. Right. Well, that's faith. And it and it, <laughs> it's almost regardless of religion. 
Right. I, I happen to have a set of beliefs, and, but I'm not going to impose those on anybody well, else. You don't, wear, you don't wear them on your sleeve. Because... But I am a strong man of faith because I do believe that somehow, some way, I've been really fortunate in life. And it's not just a coincidence, not just hard work. I've been very fortunate. Good for you. Jim, this has been an amazing conversation. I want to really thank you for your time today. This went way over, but you are such a fascinating guy. I hope that we have a chance to talk again soon. Thanks. I enjoyed it, Doug. I didn't mean to go off in so much detail on all these no, things. No, it was... It's fun to do. So I appreciate the opportunity. Absolutely.